8-bit joystick. Mod Retro, the makers of the Chromatic, a new FPGA-based Game Boy Color compatible portable system, was at Portland Retro Gaming Expo. They had some nearly completed demo units on hand for us to play, and the developers were on hand to answer some questions. I had a very interesting time playing with it, and I definitely have some thoughts on it. Overall, I was very impressed by the build quality. Everything felt great. The magnesium aluminum alloy case is rounded and feels great in your hand, and everything felt like a very high level of quality. Nothing about it felt cheap, and considering the price point and the competition, that's good. It has an overall quality Game Boy Color-like experience. The different fun colors were gorgeous and were seriously nostalgia invoking. They looked better in person than they do in photos. It definitely was heavier than all the plastic shelled competition, and it felt a little better ergonomically than the analog pocket. And speaking of pockets, I definitely felt like I could slip this device into my pocket, such as my shirt or jacket, and not have it rip at the seams. Now, the major difference between the FPGBC, the analog pocket, and the Mod Retro Chromatic are the screens. The developers actually said that this is a custom screen and everything on the unit was designed around its one-of-a-kind screen. Instead of going for a higher resolution, they went for the exact same 160 by 140 resolution and size as the Game Boy Color, but with a modern bright IPS LCD display. But instead of having the square pixels next to each other, they are arranged on a grid with negative spaces between them, like the original Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. This actually gives it a very, very authentic feel, but with bright eye-popping colors. It doesn't only look better than the original Game Boy Color, but it looks as good as you wish the Game Boy Color did when you were playing it as a kid. The FPGBC has an optional grid mode that simulates this, and the analog pocket can simulate this by having a filter on the screen, but the chromatic approach just doesn't need any special filters to do this because it's natively designed right into the screen. There was an options button on the side of the unit, and it brought up an overlaid menu. This would allow you to tweak the settings such as bright the brightness of the screen and frame blending on the fly. And there also was an option to adjust the volume by this menu or by the volume rocker on the side of the unit. Some Game Boy games took advantage of manipulating the screen refresh rate to create transparency effects. This is often missing in emulation, and it takes a synergy between the hardware and software to pull it off. The developers stated that the Game Boy transparency was supported, and I look forward to playing Parodiasta on it to check it out. The developers said that they based their FPGA cores on the already insanely accurate open source FPGA cores, which I assumed it was probably based on the Mr. Project, but I didn't ask about it. And considering how good the source cores are, it would be a safe bet that they would be compatible with every single commercially released Game Boy and Game Boy Color game. I didn't ask about flash cart compatibility, but it would be a safe bet as well. The D-pad felt really, really good, but it didn't have an indent or arrows. The button membranes, likewise, had a really good feeling, and it has a decent feel right out of the box without having to wear in the membranes. The performance was super peppy. You just hit the power switch, and almost instantaneously the FPGA core was ready to go. It doesn't feel like an emulator system where you have to wait for the system to boot up. One thing of note is that the developers said that they started from an open source and open hardware perspective, and that the unit is actually put together with tri-wing screws, which are common in the Game Boy type systems, and nothing on the unit is glued together or held together with clips. They were well aware of the Game Boy modding scene, and they had hoped that they would be customizable parts for it in the future, but they didn't say that it would be from them or not. I told them that Gunpei Yakoi would be proud of them. They also stated that the system is designed to be friendly to people who want to tinker with it in both hardware and software. Their FPGA system is robust enough to hypothetically handle additional cores for other systems if some independent developers want to put some together. 
The company itself wasn't going to be supporting anything beyond Game Boy Color and Game Boy, but I think that they would be tickled to see what open source hackers could do with it. I didn't ask to see if it had any onboard memory or if the USB-C port at the bottom could be used to load data in and out of it. The software updates are also going to be installed via the USB-C port on the bottom, so it's clearly not an only power port. And they did say that they would be working on a Macintosh software updater for it, as well as Windows. So who knows if hackers will be able to take advantage of the available memory or if they would need a USB-C thumb drive sticking out of the bottom of it. And considering the Game Boy resolution is baked into the screen, you're not going to be able to play higher resolution games on it without some serious graphical compromises. Officially, they didn't announce anything, but the engineers that I spoke to would be definitely be interested in a potential developer mode that would let hackers tinker with it. Now, the unit itself is powered by three AA batteries, and they are going to sell an optional rechargeable battery pack after launch that you could charge via the USB-C port on the bottom of the unit. However, you can also buy a regular rechargeable AA batteries, but you're probably going to need to buy four of them and have a spare one as a third wheel because they typically come in a pack of four. It was interesting and questionable that they designed it for the deliberately retro experience of having to deal with AA batteries instead of having an internal rechargeable battery. Another super cool thing about the USB-C port is that it will have video output when you connect it to a computer with a USB cable. It will actually identify as a web camera and then you can capture video and stream from it just by plugging it in. They actually had a two-player Tetris setup running OBS, which is the same web streaming software that I use to record video for this YouTube channel. Now, the analog pocket requires an additional analog pocket dock, and then you have to hook up to an HDMI capture device. And that's an extra 100 bucks for the dock and then for your capture device. This thing can stream from the handheld unit with no extra hardware. This thing is totally going to be a favorite for Game Boy streamers, which is apparently going to be a thing. And the space in between the pixels and the grid effect actually came across in the video capture, so that was dope. Mod Retro is going to be publishing their own Game Boy Color games designed by independent developers that they're going to be publishing and manufacturing. And these cartridges are going to be compatible with everything that can play Game Boy Color, including original hardware and their competitors. The employees that I talked to were quite chuffed that their system was going to be for sale in GameStop as well as online and other retailers. I told them that GameStop actually needed to have some actual honest-to-god retro systems in their so-called retro stores, so hopefully this will be mutually beneficial. So at 199 it's a lot more than the FPGBC, and you also need to throw in 10 to 20 bucks in order to get some batteries for it. Unlike the FPGBC, this is already pre-assembled and the aluminum magnesium alloy case feels a heck of a lot better than the plastic FPGBC. The analog pocket has Game Boy Advance support and support for other systems via adapters and open FPGA. But if you want to get a metal shell, that's 500 bucks. And the Game Boy Color itself was about $90 when it was launched, but if you adjust for inflation, it's about $150 today, and that had a plastic case, and the screen was not backlit. Now, the $200 price point is completely understandable when you look at all the things that you're actually getting with it. And it's also pretty desirable for someone who isn't into the Game Boy modding scene and just wants to buy a modern Game Boy compatible system to play out of the box without having to tinker with it. So they're going to have their own line of games on cartridge, but since the games are going to run on everything else, they need to sell the hardware at a profit, not at a loss that's made up from software sales. I was initially skeptical in my first reaction to their unveiling video, but actually holding the system in my hand answered a lot of my questions as with chatting with their people. I am cautiously optimistic about where this is going. I have toned down some of my previous skepticism and it has been replaced with some actual enthusiasm seeing where this new handheld system is going. I've always hoped that other companies would make new retro game systems. Well, here's one. If you like this video, then you should totally subscribe because I have new videos like this each week. 
This is 8-Bit Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro. Thank you.